The Last of Us, episode one review, the show which has a time jump. At least I think it did, because certain sections just felt like they went on for 20 years. Now don't get me wrong, there were some excellent sections to this episode, taken from the games. And there were some really, really boring sections, which weren't. There were also some major red flags with regards to characterization, especially towards the end of the episode and what they're doing to Joel. So strap in and strap on, because this could be a roller coaster of a series. We start with a flashback to 1968. They're talking about future threats to humanity, and one of them's like, oh yeah, it's definitely a cold, mate. Pan meaning all, the whole world becomes sick all at once. We may simultaneously run out of tissues, and no one's prepared for that. The other scientist, though, he's got a different theory, that the greatest danger to people is actually fungus. A sneeze is a sneeze, but a fungus can actually take over a person, control them, and make them do anything make their only drive wanting to actually spread the fungus to other people. He talks about the real-life fungus, which targets ants, controls them, makes them climb a tree, and then explodes their faces to spread the spores out over to other ants. There is one problem with it, though, and it highlights a major problem with the show. Because the fungus they're talking about, uh, this ought to be interesting, is called the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. But their problem is, it spreads itself through spores, you know, like in the original game which they've taken out from this series. Spores are no longer a thing, because that would mean that everyone would have to walk around in a gas mask when there were spores around, and actors don't like wearing masks, because you can't see the actors and it's all about their own egos. So the entire point of this scene, which is to ground the series in reality and actually tie it to something in real life, is completely undermined because of decisions they made to benefit the actors' own egos. This scene also goes on for over three minutes and is almost entirely pointless. You only learn that this show is about a fungus, and you could have just skipped all of that, got into the action, and made people learn about it when stuff was actually happening, rather than the incredibly slow opening which this series has for no reason. The start of this episode is definitely something that would have benefited from just sticking with the game. But we wake up and we get introduced to Joel's daughter. As you can see, incredible likeness to the game, she's basically the spitting image. It gives me a lot of hope for a faithful adaptation throughout the rest of the series. We get to see father and daughter side by side. All I'm saying is if I was you, mate, I'd be having a DNA test. And it's very basic and slow scene. How old are you again? 36. I'm sorry, but that's the most unbelievable part of the episode, and this is a show about zombies. I'm almost 36. We are not the same. Then we get introduced to Uncle Tommy, who works with Joel. Although their job doesn't really make sense. Concrete guy's gonna be there? Said maybe. Can't frame until we pour, we're not getting paid until we frame. We desperately need the concrete guys, otherwise we can't do any work. Could bring someone else on, get the job done faster. How is bringing more guys on going to speed up the job? You can't do anything until the concrete guys arrive. Tommy might be the thickest person in the world, we can't do job B until job A's done. Yes, but what if we brought even more people on to do the work after the bottleneck? Yes, it's got absolutely nothing to do with the story. But that's also kind of my point, why are we having this story in the first place? You clearly didn't care about it, because you didn't even make it make sense. You can work a double. How is working a double going to help you? You can't do anything until the concrete guys arrive. You can't frame until they pour. But obviously all of this is an excuse to stay out of the house for a long time, so we can watch Sarah do absolutely nothing for far too long. I'll bring back a cake, I promise. At this point, sugar's the only thing that's gonna get me through the first 20 minutes of this show. It does improve, it gets a lot better. But the start of this, we do get hints there's a radio report about disturbances in Jakarta, which then just devolves into a look how smart Sarah is simulator. Jakarta. Where is that, Middle East? Definitely a country, maybe part of Asia. There were some reasonable assumptions there. Where's Jakarta? I don't know. I think it's a country, probably in Asia. Now, Sarah is just going to crap all over them, even though she doesn't make any sense. Jakarta isn't a country. Being a part of Asia isn't mutually exclusive with being a country. Nobody said it was, dear. He said it's definitely a country, probably in Asia. He didn't say that everywhere in Asia was a country. You're going to be a smart ass. At least make sure you're correct. Otherwise, you'd just come across as an arse. Fact, it's the capital of Indonesia. You could have just said that, love. Hope for us, yeah. She knows the capital of Indonesia. We finally got a smart one in the family. But we got to see the family dynamic. All in all, pretty pointless scene. I don't see a problem with how the game did it. Apparently, Drunkman did. But Sarah sneaks into her dad's room, steals his watch, some cash, and takes a big interest in his knife. Although she does put it back afterwards. We get introduced to the neighbors for a later scene. Again, I don't know why I should care. Yeah, I want some biscuits. Those are not biscuits. I'm sorry to any of my American cousins across the pond, but... Those are not biscuits. Dad, you love biscuits. Luckily, we jump past this quickly because literally no one on earth cares. Cut to a scene of Sarah in school. Does this have a point? No. We see her watching the time. The teacher goes, this is how English works. You'll really use this in the rest of your life. And then we leave. I'm not even exaggerating. Yes, you need to know this. Yes, it's on your test next week. 
No, seriously, that was a scene. So she gets on a bus, goes into town to get the watch that she stole fixed. Now we're over 11 minutes into the episode and this is the first interesting thing to happen. We're closing. Santisma, we're done for today. Yeah, this woman comes out the back. We're closing. You need to leave. You can't stay here. I don't care about your watch. Just give it and go. I'm very sorry. He cannot finish. You should go home. So she clearly knows there's something wrong. She's clearly heard reports of the zombies which are going around killing everybody. She doesn't tell the vulnerable little girl in her shop. She doesn't give her any information about what's happening. At this point, she knows that something major is going down, enough that they have to prepare for it, and she doesn't tell the little child. <laughs> if I meet anyone who knows a zombie apocalypse is happening and they don't warn me, I'm holding a grudge. So she just sends her out. Yeah, go home on your own. It's fine. Fine. Don't mind the zombie apocalypse. Doesn't even tell her. Pulling the blinds over your windows is renowned for stopping zombies breaking in. Either way, she gets home and we get to visit the neighbors again. Another pointless scene with characters nobody cares about who are about to die in about five minutes. All of this could have been skipped. None of this adds to the story. And it was skipped in the game. You see what I mean about warning signs for the future series? Because this episode does kind of stick towards the game's path, but the reviews say it doesn't as it progresses further onwards. Which for me is a major red flag when this is the quality of what they want to add to the game's story. So we've got the grand in the wheelchair, the husband and wife, and their dog. Hey, is everything okay? Like, on the news? Like what, hun? Huh? There was just a lot of police and stuff on the road today. Well, that's true every day, isn't it? I don't know. Should we check the news? Sarah has lived up to this point. She does have a baseline of how many police are on the road. For some reason now, she thinks there's more activity, and she got kicked out of a watch shop because something major's going down. Hasn't told her that. Maybe that'd change her opinion. Maybe if the characters could give each other all of the information and just turn on the news, this might go a lot better. People out there need to get right with Jesus. I don't think you have to worry about that, love. In a few minutes, they're not gonna have much choice. So they bake cookies. No, I have no idea what this has got to do with the story either. There's literally a whole montage of them making cookies. Let's get the ingredients. Oh, they're baking. Yeah, they're baking. Oh, look, she's doing homework while they bake. This is supposed to be a zombie show. Show me a zombie. Now, Gran is in a wheelchair and it looks like she just can't move or talk altogether. She just kind of sits there at all times, which, you know, is nice to tick off the checklist, if nothing else. But it does lead to one of the few interesting moments of the introduction when she's picking a DVD. Because as she's choosing, you can actually see her off in the background. And then we get this. We get what I can only assume is an impression of the Edward Munch screaming woman painting. And it is suitably creepy. It's moments like this that I really like, and this was added in. I just think they need to be a bit more picky about what they add in rather than everything else that led up to this. Because this was a cool moment and the show definitely does add some things which improve on what was there. It just really takes its time getting there. But she makes her excuses to leave. We see that Granny has now returned to her old ways, except the dog senses there's something different about her and is making a bit of a fuss. Dogs, they'd cry and whine if you ever turned into a zombie, but cats? they'd eat you. Goes home, still nobody's checking the news, and this is where things start to stretch incredulity for me. Earlier in the day, there was already reports of disturbances from other places in the world, to the point where you find out later on it can turn you in 10 minutes. There's absolutely no way with telephones, television, and radios, the news of what it was wouldn't have already spread to this country, and then there would have just been uproar around the entire place. And yet even now, apparently no one in this entire road has checked the news. <laughs> Fighter jets are flying over, so the military know there's something going on, but apparently no one in the public does. I just don't think you can get that with modern technology, even up to the point of radio, television, and telephone. Evening now, and she's got the news on which talks about a violent spree which is breaking out. I'm sorry, but if people are turning into zombies controlled by plants, the moment you found one of these violent people, you wouldn't just think they were normal. Whereas if you'd done the start from the game, you wouldn't have had to have thought about whether all of this made sense. You really made a rod for your own back on this one. But Joel finally comes home. He locked the door for once. Good job. Which at least is a decent way of telling us that it's got to her, that all of this news, she knows there's something weird going on right now, and so she's trying to take precautions against it. Which is very reasonable, because you'd know there'd be some people like, why don't we just teach the zombies not to attack people? I think we should normalize being a zombie, take the stigma out of it. Yes, he may want to go and eat his neighbor's brains, but he's not in control of his own instincts. I think we need to create a safe space for the zombie community. But we get more into the game lore here, and it's where the episode certainly picks up. 
which I don't think is a coincidence. She gives him his birthday present, which is the watch that she got fixed earlier, and that is one hell of a face from Pedro. Fixed it for you. Did you? I don't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> they take entire scenes and scripts directly from the game, and it's definitely to the show's benefit. Although I did like this interaction. Where'd you get the money for this? It was only $20, which I stole from you. I could have stolen 60 but I put the change back because I'm an honest thief. It straddles that line across honest, witty, and annoying brat all at the same time. But they watch a DVD, so Joel never actually gets to see the news reports, and then she falls asleep. Don't fall asleep. Of course I won't. It's too riveting. If you were going to do an intro, I definitely think more father-daughter scenes and less just her at school or in a city would have helped the situation. Because it's this which is the entire foundation of the future story, and so the rest of it just didn't really matter that much. I don't care about the neighbours, even though you've spent a load of time with them. Now Joel has to leave because Tommy has got himself locked up and needs to be bailed out. You kind of think it's bad because, oh, what happened? Did he get arrested? But it turned out a guy in a bar just went mental and he knocked him out and then got in trouble for it, which given what we know is happening to people, actually makes him the good guy. Guy goes crazy, starts swinging at a waitress. I stepped in, knocked him out, cops show up, look. Considering the entire country is having such a disaster that fighter jets are flying over the sky, you'd think the police would be a little bit too busy to worry about a random bar brawl. But apparently no, they've just got infinite resources at the moment, which they're about to need very, very soon. Madhouse, Joel. I gotta get out. We also start stepping up the warning signs, which is good. The more little hints and Easter eggs there are in this section of the show, I definitely thinks help people going until later on when it actually kicks off. So he goes to pick up Tommy, puts her in a bed, and all this is going down at 11. It is now quarter past two in the morning, so just three hours later, and everything has hit the fan. Which makes sense, because if people can turn in 10 minutes, depending on where they're bitten, everything can multiply very quickly. But this would have been happening around the world, and we would have had information from other countries. And I think this entire introduction probably should have been cut, because it really drags down the rest of the episode, especially when it makes as little sense as it does. But she wakes up. Yeah, it may have something to do with the massive explosions in the distance, and the sirens, and the planes. I think more helicopters fly over in this episode than my country has. So she goes to check for Joel. He's not there. The helicopter flying over made anyone who's watching this with a subwoofer on demolish their entire house. She checks the TV. There's no channels, but there is a national alert. Indoors. Law enforcement and emergency services are in the area. Tell me what the problem is, and telling me to stay indoors really just makes it seem like you don't want me clogging up the road so you can escape. <laughs> If ever there's a zombie apocalypse, the best thing to do is go out into the wild where there's barely any people. Because if there was no people before, there's not going to be many zombies. I don't know, it just seems like common sense to me. Contact with further instructions. <laughs> but the dog appears, he's like, hello, missus, my owners have gone mental. Please, can you feed me instead of those lunatics? I don't know how they got him to do that, but it was very cute. We get more helicopters flying over. And I don't know about anyone else, but if I was a little girl and there was a big thing going, STAY INSIDE! I wouldn't just walk out into the middle of the road. Uh, this is America, at least take something to defend yourself with, love. But she tries to drag the dog back home. Come on, Mercy, please. Yeah, he is not going back in there, which makes him the smart one. Remember how the show tried to make out that she was the smart one earlier in the episode? Well, um... She's not as bright as a dog. As he escapes and runs off. You're a lunatic, you wanna go in that house? I know what's in there. Bearing in mind the dog refuses to go into the house, she decides to go in herself to see why. Mrs. Adler? Are you a zombie, Mrs. Adler? Knock twice if you're a zombie killing your entire family. I have no idea why everyone does this in TV shows. <laughs> but she goes into the entirely dark house, doesn't try and put on any of the lights. Why would I put on any of the lights when I could walk around this dark and very ominous building? Mrs. Adler? Are you a zombie, Mrs. Adler? <laughs> she hears a noise in the kitchen. Mrs. Adler? Are you are- Okay, I'm not gonna do it again. Now at this point, she slips on a red wet patch on the floor. And if you don't run at this moment, and quite frankly, anything that happens to you is entirely your fault. Oh, I wonder what this red, sticky, wet substance could be on the floor. Remember, she's the smart one in the family. Instead, she just stares at her foot for a while, looks over to where it's coming from, and there is a wee bit of a problem. The stupid thing is, He's trying to talk to her, and rather than being like, okay, I need to go and get help. Oh no, no. She doesn't leave. 
I'm going to walk up to him. I don't know whether the threat's still here. I don't know how this happened. I don't know what's done it. I just know I'm going to walk into the same room as whatever it is. Because he can't even talk. So he's definitely like, look over there. Why haven't you looked around the room? You've just walked in a kitchen straight at someone. Not even looked around the room. Uh, oh yeah, there she is. It's a good job I know what's coming because there's absolutely no way she would survive the apocalypse if she's this thick. I'm going to walk into a danger zone and not even look around with my head on a swivel for danger. No, just eyes straight ahead. If you can't see it, it can't see you. You're fine. There is a problem when she's just like hoffing on the other woman's neck. For some reason, she's still not left the building yet. Although it does give us this rather cool shot. Because I thought that was hair at first. It's not hair. It's actually part of her. And she's a wee bit spryer than she used to be. <laughs> Finally, she decides to run. All it took was a lunatic to scream at her. It runs out the house. And what we get next is entirely the highlight of the entire episode. It's like a 15 minute sequence, almost taken shot for shot from the game, including the script with very minor changes, which I actually think add to the episode rather than take away from it and don't change the overarching plot. Sticking to the plot with minor changes that surprise people but don't actually change anything in the grand scheme of things is the way I would have done the series. Because for now, Joel and Tommy have arrived. They know there's something going on, but they haven't really had to do that much yet. Get the truck right now! At this point, I'm really glad she didn't start arguing. Why? What's happening? I need to know all about the problem before I actually obey your shouted instruction. No, when I tell you to get in the truck, you get in the truck because we're all about to die. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely have no idea if that was meant to be funny, but this happens multiple times throughout the episode. I think it's meant to be tense, but I'm just laughing my way through the scene. There's one bit later, which is hilarious. <laughs> it's one of the funniest things I've seen. She decides to just charge at them. What are we doing, Joe? You have to make a decision in a short amount of time, and he decides that she definitely needed a wrench to the face. I burst out laughing at that bit, and I am not ashamed. <laughs> so Joel drops his only weapon, which is probably the most stupid move he could have made, and they get in the car and drive off. Joel! Denise, you get back inside the house! For some reason, she doesn't shout back, but you're not staying inside your house as he drives down the road. As they drive off, there's two people clearly under the influence in front of him. <laughs> Although I'm not sure he had to swerve at him, that is a bit weird. But you cut to behind the car and see the woman he just spoke to run up to them and get swarmed. What can I say? She was strong, independent, and definitely needed to listen to somebody else. Now all of this is straight out of the games, and so if you've played the games, you know what's coming. Even the script is just lifted straight from it, and this is easily, for me, the best part of the entire episode. No cell phone, no radio. How do you know we're not sick? They go through the discussion of what they know, what they're gonna do next, which roads to take. Everyone else is trying to leave at the same time, so it's a mess. You're saying it's mostly people in the city. It's also what you'd expect with something that has exponential growth. More people equals more people. So you'd think everyone's logical assumption would be, I need to leave a city. <laughs> if I'm in the countryside, then I'm just going to go into a forest. And we get everything from the game. We get Jimmy's place burning down. She starts to panic that if it came from the city, then I was also in the city, so if I got it... You'd have to go a lot, right? We're fine, trust me. Yeah, when in doubt just lie to everybody. Again, at this point, they've caused more trouble for themselves than positives with the intro because she doesn't tell them about the dogs, doesn't even think of the dogs or that they were warning of what happened earlier in the show. That would be really useful information. Apparently, she's just stupid though and forgot. Wasn't a problem in the game. Other stuff from the game is the family with the kid that uh, Joel, to be honest, has the right idea about. We got a kid, Joel. So do we. Hey, Keep driving. Hey, Somebody else will come along. You have no idea what the problem is. You have no idea what state they're in. If you want to survive, your speed is of the essence. In a world like this, tough guys survive who make tough decisions. There is no bleeding hearts that survive the first wave. So given the showrunners have said that they want Joel to be soft in this series, I'm glad they kept that in. Of course, they want to leave, everybody else wants to leave, and so all the roads are closed. They decide to cut across a field, which they've got a fort before, they can do, and find out on the other side is the army blocking everything off. They're setting up entire quarantine zones no one can get out of. And they mean business. Not only got helicopters with searchlights, they've even got tanks on the road. <laughs> There's actually a crap ton of tanks long here now I actually sit and look at it, which means that the military definitely know what's going on, and yet they haven't told people over the TV about it. Again, I think they would. So they decide to go north because everything else is blocked off, even though north leads into the city. Maybe it's everywhere. Maybe there's nowhere to go. All right, calm down, sunshine. You're overwhelming me with your optimism here. You know the other people besides bleeding hearts that don't survive the apocalypse? People who just give up and go, Oh, it's so horrible. Maybe there's no way out. Doesn't matter if there's no way out. The point is that you survive now and then survive tomorrow. But then we get multiple jumbo jets flying over their heads and it's incredibly loud. Again, if you're watching with a subwoofer, your house has collapsed. I am going to spare you the audio of this. 
because quite frankly, it's it's way too loud. I massively decreased my volume throughout this entire section because it's stupid. Yeah, I get it, there's planes and jumbo jets, but you didn't have to deafen me to show me them. I think the interesting thing here, though, is that is a jumbo jet being chased down by fighter planes. So we do get the cool story of, we will not allow you to enter this country, no matter what it takes. They run into problems, though, when the police start setting up blockades around the city. I don't know why, it seems entirely too late at this point, but again, it's from the games. We drive further into the city, and this happens. Alright, keep going, keep going. They narrowly avoid a crash, which in the game actually hit them. And this is what I mean about Little Surprises, I actually like this change, because everyone was expecting it to happen, and so you still make it happen and then change it, and now I was like, oh, what, what's, what's going on now? If you want subvert expectations, I think this is the good kind. Because they continue to drive, and we're still in the actual game scene, all of this happened. We haven't changed the plot, we're still hitting the same beats, just slightly deviated. Because there's just people all over the place, just like, just drive through them, he refuses. And they realize they just can't go forwards anymore. Tell me, you can't stop here. I can't drive through them. Are you serious? Just keep going! Then an entire cinema empties in front of them, and they're just like, okay, there's too many people to get through at this point. We need to go back. Unfortunately, that's not really going to help them given what's behind them. Because we get a backwards view when there's another plane in the distance. Move. Move! Because that plane is coming down, and we get the other change, which I quite liked as well. The plane blows up. It's actually a bit of the plane which hits them, which then sends us back on track to the game where they got hit by the car. So even though we slightly changed some of the events, we still ended up in the same place. Joel immediately goes to rescue his daughter as soon as he's free. And I have to say at this point, don't you think this would have been a better introduction to the episode? All that stuff at the start could have just been cut out. We could have started where the game did, it would have been so much better. You launched the episode directly into this, what a hook that would have been. Because I really like this entire section from the game just put into real life, it's great. Now Sarah got injured in the crash, she can't walk and Joel decides to carry her. But next there's a problem to take care of because the next section of the game didn't have the entire family together. Gotta get off the street! <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. Sherry's car crashes into their car, sets on fire, and now they're separated by a wall. So Tommy splits off one way and they split off the other. We even get the little I'm going to talk to you through bits of the car scene. <laughs> Head of the river, I'll find a way. Yeah, you better do, because otherwise we're in trouble. You're the one with the gun, mate. We can't leave him. What would you propose we do, love? Both cars are on fire, they've got petrol tanks and could explode at any second. Would you like to be the one that climbs over them first with your broken ankle? Can you run? No. I know you've broken your ankle, but can you run? <laughs> Joel, ever the optimist. So he carries her off, runs around a corner, and what he's about to see, I don't know why he stopped and stared and just waited. But it wasn't very smart. Because we see this image with people moving, and he's just standing there, staring at them as they're getting eaten. You've got a little girl, dude. Run away. Still standing there, though. It's fine. Don't worry about it. In fact, he stands there so long that one of them eventually notices him, and only then does he think, I probably shouldn't be near all of this. There's a still an explosion gone off. He's still standing there. I don't know what it was about the way that guy kind of <laughs> straight up, but it was really cool. I I don't know, it's the little things that count. Only when he's actually been noticed by the zombies does he decide that I should probably get out of here. So he runs through the door, and I have to say, it's this bit where I was just wetting myself throughout the entire scene. Because he runs through, and it's the way the zombie approaches every single obstacle. I don't know who this actor was, but you need to give him a pay rise. Joel? Joel just runs into a cafe. He can run in a straight line. This other actor, though, really goes for it. just ran head first into an obstacle as hard as he could, and he does not stop there. <laughs> Look at him, what a boss! You have a trampoline hidden behind that thing or something. Oh, this guy didn't break something as he goes along, because my favourite is the moment coming up. <laughs> Look at that! <laughs> so Mr. Director, what do you want me to do? Well, if you could run head first into a table, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Even smashed his face? into a closing door and fell over on the pavement. When people ask me what was my favourite moment of this scene, it's gonna be this, with that actor specifically. I don't know who he is, I don't know what he's done, but I want him in everything. Either way, he's chasing Joel, but just as he's about to catch him, a shot rings out, and at this point, I did think it was Tommy because I'd forgot the game. And then I remembered, oh yeah, this is where the game does something, um, interesting. Because it ain't Tommy. It's the military, and he's shouting at them. Don't move, don't come towards me. I need to ask my superiors what to do next. We're not sick. We're gonna get you somewhere safe first. Don't go back for him, okay? I'm sorry, Yeah, even the soldier is surprised by what he's been asked to do. Although he doesn't hesitate when given his instructions. Yes, sir. 
Joel realizes exactly what's about to happen, tries to bargain, tries to get away, but there's absolutely no way he can get out of this scenario. And I do actually prefer the way it's done in this series than it is in the game. In the game, as he's firing, there's this weird scene where Joel tries to protect her with his body, but then does a full 360 and ends up showing her to the gun again, and it's not great. I know he probably got shot and couldn't help it in theory, but in this it's just a spray when both of them are kind of facing him. I think it's a bit more realistic. We're not sick. That's not going to help you out of this one, I'm afraid. So they roll down a hill, and just when the guy is about to finish Joel off... I'm sorry. You sure will be. Tommy comes to save the day. Unfortunately, Sarah has been hit. And again, another scene from the game, I thought it was well done, sets up Joel for the future. Why we spent so long in a boring introduction when this scene did everything it needed to in the game and the TV show anyway? I'm not really sure, and that's one of my main criticisms for this episode, although I think it has a lot of strong points. There's a lot you could have cut out of it. But then we get the time jump of 20 years, which is how long the introduction felt before we actually got to the game content. But don't worry, we're back to the added scenes again, and that makes them entirely pointless to the story. A kid staggering through a forest. He finds the city, well, what remains of it. I like the big walled fortification. We've gone back to castles, people. When your enemies are as stupid as fungus, a wall is good enough. Kid just collapses in front of the guards. They bring him in, and we get to see the chart of turn time. So if you get bit in the neck, face, or head, it's 5 to 15 minutes. Sort of your center region, torso, arms, shoulders, 2 to 8 hours. And the further away it is from your brain, the longer it is, to 12 to 24 hours. Given that people can turn from 5 to 15 minutes, that whole unnecessary prolonged introduction where, oh, we don't know what's happening and no one's talking about it on the TV, really, really doesn't seem very realistic, does it? Also, I do like the symptoms of coughing, slurred speech, muscle spasms, and mood change. No idea what could cause that except fungus. We don't want you falling out of the chair. Yeah, we strapped your arms, chest, and legs to this chair, just in case you fell out. Oh, we've all done that, haven't we? You're just scrolling around, and the next thing's- oh! We've all been there. If only I was strapped into mine, I'd be a lot safer. And after they've done all of this, we get what should have just been done at the gate, surely. Because they have a device that just tells you whether you've got the fungus in you or not. Positive, negative, job done. His comes back clear, he's perfectly fine. Why didn't we just do that when he was outside instead of bringing him in the city to do it? If we'd just done it outside, we wouldn't need to strap him to the chair, which 100% wasn't for his own protection. You're safe. Well, I'd be entirely reassured by that. Oh yeah, we did cut to the burning bodies immediately afterwards. Maybe not that safe. There really is only one fast way to get rid of people, and they've decided to do this. I mean, when you're reduced to this, there's probably quite a few you need to get rid of, and they need to get rid of a lot. This entire team's doing it, and at this point, we find Joel. The person that's been loading everyone else onto the fire, uh, she does have a line. Can't. Joel, though, doesn't have the same line. Doesn't like it, seems to affect him, but he gets the job done, and just basically says yeet and moves on. We see him go through his daily routine of odd jobs, collects his ration cards at the end of it, and asks for more work. Nothing today. Tomorrow we got street sweeping or sewer maintenance. Which pays more. Which do you think? Yeah, you could brush a street for a bit or climb into a sewer. I imagine one would have more takers than the other one. We get an image of some of the residents of this high-class establishment. Literally one guy with no hands. Another one on the list we can check off again. Oh, we're definitely helping that score here, aren't we? Racking up the points. You can get shoelaces for one ration card or bootlaces for two. Do you want to eat or have a shoelace? This seems like a really easy choice to me. I can gaffer tape my shoes together, no problem. There's a public gallows on display. Fun for all the family, and they have a rather interesting array of crimes between them. Unauthorized exit from a quarantine zone. Okay, so you can't leave one. That makes a lot of sense. Unauthorized entry into a You also can't enter one. It's a bit weird. <laughs> okay, I get the leaving because, you know, you could be bringing anything with you. But if people want to enter, surely that's their own problem. Don't go in there, it's dangerous. Now we've got to subject you to capital punishment. I kind of think this is even more dangerous. It turns out Joel's here to meet a guard. Now this is another addition, and at first I did think this scene was entirely pointless again. I'm still in mixed minds about it, although there is a payoff at the end. I also don't like the end, so overall I'd say we should have probably just cut all this. We spend a long time to not really get much done, they just want you to know this guard. We find out Joel's got side businesses. He's a smuggler, he brings things in from outside, and he gets information, ration cards, contact within the guard. There was one interesting part of the scene. Bullets and pills. The more you shoot people, the harder it is to sleep, I guess. Oh, you guess. This isn't just a run-of-the-mill junkie, he's taking them because he can't mentally handle the strain of what he's forced to do. It kind of puts him in a bit of a murky role, because at the end of the day, he's a horrible person, doing horrible things, and he doesn't want to, but still decides to do it anyway. Now, for me, that's not an excuse, but 
I get the feeling this show is trying to make it one. And Joel 100% doesn't give a crap. You want him or not? Now there's another change in this section I don't like. In the game he's a gun runner, and there's lots more action which this show desperately needed in this scene. It was all perfectly set up in the game, it would have been great to add in, and instead they've removed it, and he's after a car battery. We still have the perfect opportunity to show us a bit of action, and we just prefer to go for boredom instead. The guard does give him a bit of advice. You want to stay off the streets for the next few nights because there's a lot of stuff going on. Everyone's anxious on guard, and uh... We may not be able to give you the leniency that we did before. Now this scene's an interesting one. As far as I remember, it's an addition, but I also think it's an improvement. Largely because of one moment that happens later. That said, I, I don't think it's really well written and it doesn't really make much sense. It's mainly the end of it that I like, because they're talking about what's happening. She's like, I promise, I won't say anything. And that's why he doesn't want her to say anything, because they bashed her around a bit. It's just a truck battery. I paid you for it, you sold it to someone else and you spend my money. And there's the problem, he's the one that cheated her. But for some reason, she's the one who's beat up. I'd rather see whatever led up to this, because none of this makes any sense. If he's the one that ripped her off, why is she the one that's battered, and yet he's kind of begging her, please don't tell anyone about this? If you were that desperate for her not to tell anyone about it, why did you beat her up in the first place? But obviously, she's surrounded, she's not in control, and so she's just like, look, look, I'll let it go. We'll all let it go. I won't tell anyone about it. I wouldn't believe her personally. I'm also not sure this is Tess's character. But the ending is really cool. Because after she apologizes, I won't tell anyone, and he's kind of weighing up to her to just get rid of her now so that she can't tell anybody, uh, this happens. Yeah. yeah, it comes out of nowhere, the wall explodes and knocks everyone over, allowing her to escape. It's mainly that bit why I like the scene, because the rest of the scene didn't really make sense, the story didn't make sense, nor did the dynamic between any of the people involved. But I was willing to overlook that because of how it ended. <laughs> there are some things that you can see coming, and I definitely did not know that was gonna happen. When everyone else is knocked over, she manages to escape out of the big gaping hole in the wall, and it looks like there's been a car bomb. Unfortunately, as she walks down the street, there's a whole load of troops coming down the road, and there's a sniper on the roof taking pot shots at him, so this is why you shouldn't be on the road, and Joel was warned earlier. That's about all the action and shooting you're gonna get from the rest of the episode, I'm afraid. She then panics because there's other people coming towards the sound of gunshots the other way around, and she might get wrapped up in it. Desperately tries to surrender, shouting, I'm not a firefly, and gets taken into custody. They're shooting at us! On your knees! And they're not particularly gentle about it. Cut to Ellie, who's chained to a radiator. Ellie entirely misses annoyingly endearing, and jumps straight to arse. Now the fireflies, without any of the high-tech gear, have their own little way of working out whether you've turned. You'd think it'd be obvious with the plants growing out of your mouth, but apparently, no, they've got a more low-key method. Count slowly and clearly from 1 to 10. Let's face it, there's probably some healthy people that struggle with that one. We go back to Joel with a scene which, again, is basically entirely pointless. This is another scene they added in, doesn't have a point. There's a certain pattern here. Most of the scenes which are good come from the games, but most of the scenes they've added in and aren't good. This is a really long, drawn-out scene, all to find out that he wants to talk to Tommy, and Tommy sends him messages. Which doesn't make sense, and it is a deviation from the game, where they were sort of estranged and weren't talking to each other. But in this, they want to make out that he's estranged, but also in frequent communication with him. So much communication, that if we don't talk for a day, then clearly that's a sign that something horrible has gone on despite the fact that they've fallen out with each other. One of the issues with messing with law is the people that do it tend to not know what they're doing. They can't keep any story straight in their own heads. Bribes the guy who basically keeps track of radio frequencies. Tommy responded we'd know. And you're talking to the tower. Every day. They gave him your message they haven't seen or heard from him since. It's been three weeks. It's never taken him more than a day to respond. This is a guy who's estranged from his brother, and yet he replies every day. So we're now simultaneously in a position where he's in constant contact with his brother, to where he replies within 24 hours off in a far distant land, but also has completely fallen out with him, doesn't talk to him, and the fireflies are to blame. Two different realities are now true at the same time in this series. All because of this scene, which was added in, and didn't need to because it doesn't serve any point. Apart from telling him a location of where he was, which in the game wasn't a big deal. He just knew it. Joel, it's in Wyoming. All, all this open country? There are worse things than infected out there. Basically the only point of the scene to tell the audience that outside the city walls it's dangerous. Yeah, I think we could have grasped that one for ourselves, thanks. You didn't need to destroy the lore about his brother just to get that point across. After that, Joel goes home and raids his little secret stash in his place, which, unlike The Witcher Blood Origins, he at least hid under a wardrobe so people wouldn't accidentally walk on it. I mean, it wasn't a high bar with Witcher Blood Origins, but I'm very thankful that we finally gotten above it. His bed is just set on breeze blocks, and it strikes me as one of those Twitter posts where someone's like, 
How can men live like this and be happy? Because we value different things, and quite frankly, I wouldn't mind. We get a little scene of him planning on a map how he can get to his brother and absolutely downing a bottle before totally passing out in bed. Tess comes back. I mean, that's one hell of a reveal of your face, isn't it? I got jumped by a couple guys. Yeah, it's an interesting scene, this. It's an addition. It didn't need to be done. And it doesn't make sense. Let's just keep track of Tess's logic, shall we? She tells him that she got jumped by two guys, which is the story she told the original guy that she was going to tell him. I'm not going to tell him it was you because he'll get angry, he'll come for you. And she was trying to convince a way out of a dead end that you'll only let me go if he doesn't know what you've done to me. So she's going to lie. After the brick wall, then she had a choice. Either she could keep a word and lie to him so that he wouldn't go after him, or she could tell him the truth and then they go after him for revenge. There is no reason to say both stories to him because it doesn't make any sense. That's what Tess is gonna do though. First, she lies to him saying I got jumped by teenagers. What oh, guys? Just a couple of teenagers. And then in the same conversation for absolutely no reason whatsoever, tells him the truth. I need you to take a breath. What? The guys who jumped me were with Robert. Why are we saying both stories? This is like a Telltale game where no matter which voice line you choose, we always end up in the same place and say the same things anyway. Yeah, sure, she lied to him about who jumped her, only to tell him the truth. A minute later. At no point does he go, well, you just told me it was teenagers a few seconds ago. Why, why are you suddenly changing your story? No, now we've just jumped to the other parallel dimension where she told him the truth. But no one's going to question why the story contradicted itself in mere minutes. And so now we decide, okay, we definitely need that battery. I don't care what he stole from you. I need the battery to go talk to my brother, who normally replies within a day, even though we don't talk, because he hasn't replied in three weeks. This is literally the plot. We get our money back and the battery. Robert is terrified of you. So you march out of here all clean Eastwood. He's going to get wind of it and skip. Yeah, this guy is absolutely terrified of you. Do we know why? No. You know what would have been nice? If we'd seen the action scene from the game put into the TV show that completely explained why somebody would have been scared of him, but instead, just assume it. It's probably his moustache. Look, we told you he's scary. We don't need to actually show you him doing anything. That, that'd, be, that'd be stupid. Now we're with Marlene, the leader of the Fireflies, and she's getting questioned by her second in command. We've been blowing up meaningless Fedra targets spread out all over the QZ. What's the point of this? I don't know why you're even asking that. You're a second in command, who cares? I don't even know why you're really asking. You're not in charge, so why are you demanding answers from your superior? These are people who are actually meant to be sort of their version of the military, the rebellion military. And yet, for some reason, they're strictly individualist. Who cares about chain of command? I want to know your reasoning. I especially demand answers in front of these two random people who absolutely don't have clearance to know anything about it. My answer is to follow f***ing orders. Based. Shut your mouth, do what you're told. Our people are asking what's going on. But she absolutely won't shut up and just keeps whining and whining and whining. And for some reason, it works with the leader of the operation. It's like, okay, I wasn't going to tell you before. I was just going to tell you to follow orders. But now you've kept complaining at me. I'll just tell you all my secrets. You two, go to Southeast 3. Yeah, it's time to tell her everything. I had absolutely no intention of letting you in on my plan, but you just kept nagging. Now you get everything you want as a reward. That's definitely how you teach someone to obey the chain of command. <laughs> we are in a war against a military dictatorship to restore democracy, and freedom. Yeah, that's right. The fireflies in this are supposed to be the good guys. They're not the good guys. They were never the good guys. I don't know why we're trying to make out they're the good guys. Yeah, you just want to overturn one group of people so that you're the ones in charge. Let's not try and dress this up as freedom when you just be the ones with the new boot. But she tells her basically everything about the girl, about why they're detonating bombs all over the place. It's to distract and spread out all of the guards and take them away from the only place that matters where they are, where the girl is. Because on a certain night, they're all going to group up on this building and leave the entire town with the girl all at the same time. Would have made a lot more sense in the game. Doesn't really make sense here. Doesn't really make sense why they can't do that plan here either. Because they never explain why they can't do that plan. It's once again a case where we've changed the law, but we can't keep track of it. And we're trying to change the game's law while also sticking to it. And so we end up with a story that doesn't make sense. Every Firefly in Boston is going to gather in this building and we're going to leave the QZ. Remember, that's the plan. So at some point, something should happen to explain why we can't do that. Nothing happens to explain why we can't do that. Whatever you need, whatever it takes, we'll get her where she needs to go. It'd be really nice if we had an army of Fireflies to do it as well, wouldn't it? If we don't have an army of Fireflies, we better have a good reason of why we don't. Another added scene that probably shouldn't have been is a Firefly coming up to Joel trying to recruit him and he just goes, I'm not interested, I'll break your jaw if you say anything. And then the guy leaves. Feeling lost. You tell me to look for the light and I'll break your jaw. Really the only reason for this scene to exist. Believe me, it was as gripping as it sounded. Now we cut to Ali and prove that she's got as many IQ points as you'd expect. Yeah. 
Not the smartest kid on the block who for some reason thinks she can break chains with her bare hands. <laughs> but she is absolutely certain that all three foot five of her can pull a radiator off a wall. We get a scene between them where Ellie's amazed she's not scared of a knife. Like seriously, you're a tiny little child with a butter knife. Of course she's not scared of you. She's meant to be a trained warrior and you're a kid. <laughs> you're not scared. No one has ever been scared of you in your entire life. You've never been walking down a dark alley and someone coming the other way has gone, oh no, this is going to end badly. She's trying to slowly gain her trust and freeze her from her chains. Ali says, if I'm not going to turn, can you just let me go? It's like, well, where are you going to go anyway? Where are you going to go? Back to Federal Military School? You think I chose that place? They put me there when I was a baby. They didn't put you there. I did. Now this is the strangest part of the story. I don't know where that's going because because they very quickly get the obvious out of the way. You're my fucking mom or something? And look like your mom? Probably the best response that she could have gotten. <laughs> look, we already had Joel needing a DNA test. We didn't need it twice. It does beg the question that if you're not her mom, why did you enroll her in that school to begin with? Or is it just a very cheap way to try and make out there's some kind of bond between these people? Because from this, there doesn't seem to be enough of a reason why she would have a bond to her. Whereas from the game, you never saw that. And so it just kind of fit because you weren't shown it. I think it's actually worse to expand on why all this stuff is happening and do it badly than just have people already in a set situation when you meet them, as then it's just accepted and you can write off in your own head whatever the canon was that makes that situation make sense. I actually think by showing the backstory to a lot of this stuff, you're degrading the experience from what we actually had in the games. There's a brief mention of Riley from the expansion, which I'm sure we're going to get an entire episode dedicated to it. It was a crap expansion, and I'm sure it's going to be a crap episode as well. But she tells her the plan that we're leaving tonight, we're taking you with us. And whatever you do, there's something that you cannot tell anybody. What I'm about to tell you cannot be repeated to anyone, because if you do, I assure you, you will die. Don't tell anyone, but we promise you, it's for your own good. This whole scene is the only reason that those two are apparently bonded together. And it showed none of it. From this scene, the kid shouldn't care about her at all, so it's weird then that she did in the games. We cut to Joel and Tess breaking into the sort of sub-basement level of that building. Their plan is to go underneath and then climb up the building in order to take them by surprise. But there's a bit of a surprise first. <laughs> yeah, it looked pretty cool. Although I would say if this is the inevitable outcome of it, you could probably just wait out the fungus. This is the problem that solves itself. It's like 28 days later. This one's done. All right, Joel, you didn't have to spell out the obvious. So they sneak underneath the building and start climbing the ladder to the correct floor. Although they find out the door they're trying to get through is barricaded on the other side. I guess put a piano in front of this. You smell that? Yeah. Gunpowder. There's been a fight on the other side of the door. Now in the game, all of this was done entirely differently and they basically shot their way through a load of fireflies in order to try and get a load of guns back from them. Of course, in this, we're after a car battery, and we can't have a fight, because that would be too entertaining to have on television. So instead, the, the fight was just done without us there, and Joel wasn't involved. They pushed through the door, and that whole fight that was done as part of the gameplay in the game has now just been, you know, someone else got to have the fun. Sure, it lowers the budget, but a whole firefight in this hallway would have definitely increased the pace of this second half of the episode and massively improved it in my opinion. Especially after that 15 minute section that they just ripped straight from the games. If they'd ripped this straight from the games as well, it would have been so much better. The people that work on this show clearly could have done justice to it and they just decided, ah, we don't need that. Does it improve the episode? No. Does it lower the budget? Yes. So I found this entire thing very, very disappointing considering what we could have had. And I think that's the problem with an adaptation. When you've just got a television series, you can judge it on its own. But when you've got a game, you've got a bar of quality that you need to beat. And any change that you make has to beat that bar because otherwise it would have just been better if you followed the game. And this is definitely something where one of the changes drastically reduces the quality of what the game was already. And if you can't match that quality bar of the game, then I don't know what you're doing in the first place. That earlier section definitely met or beats the quality bar of the game, whereas this it's a massive downgrade. Well, the battery's no good. Turns out not only did he scam her for the battery, but he was going to scam them with the battery and take both people's money with a battery that didn't even work in the first place. He still tried to sell it twice. I kind of appreciate his entrepreneurial flair, to be honest. Although he did end up a corpse on the floor, so he may have pushed it a bit far. <laughs> but everything that happens next is kind of rushed. I think it's undeserved. And we definitely could have spent the previous part of this episode, rather than doing nothing, building up to it. Because we find the fireflies are injured after their firefight. I did like how easily Joel handled her though, that was good. I know it was probably very tempting to do that. I'm strong and independent and I can beat him. It's like, no, no, 
That's exactly what would happen if someone that's untrained comes across someone who's trained. You can rant as rave as much as you want, you're still a child, you'd be able to do nothing. But now the Fireflies have a problem because they want to smuggle her out of the city, but they're injured. I don't know what happened to all the other Fireflies that are in the city, you know, the ones that were meant to be coming here tonight. We forgot about those people that we mentioned in the scene earlier. Don't think about it, turn your brain off, it'll be fine. The war must be going pretty sh for you to be buying from scumbags like him. Yeah, it kind of has. Okay, the war's been going bad, it explains why you want to leave, but you've still got other fireflies in the city that should be coming here, right? They can take the girl. Now in the game, Joel had wiped them all out, which is why he was the only person left, but in this, what happens to the other fireflies in the city? Where are they? They do have a very interesting interaction though, because they don't care at all when he's pointing a gun at them, and they're not pointing their guns at him, until she makes a reach for the knife that he's got under his boot. Don't. Not at her. The moment Joel threatens the kids, instantly they raise their guns. And yet when he points the gun back at the head of the fireflies... Point it at me. They lower their guns again. If you want to talk about show not tell in this series, that's the perfect example of it. Because now, everybody knows that that kid's special. Except not quite, because it's just a kid. He could think that she's just got a motherly bond to her, she really values the kid, and so she'd rather risk herself than a child. It simultaneously makes sense for every one of the characters in this scene that the child is more valuable than the boss. So there's entire layers of this scene for every single character, and they all make sense. I think it's a great change and a great addition on top of the game. If all of the scenes they added were like this, I'd have no problem with them at all. It's just most of them don't reach the bar of that interaction. It's our business to know things. To know things. You're the cause of it. You turn my own brother against me. Yeah, we're still going to keep that in from the games. The fireflies turn my brother against me. It's like, well, okay, but they couldn't have done that good a job with it because you talk to him and he replies within a day. Joel and the brother are estranged because of the fireflies but they also talk to each other all of the time and he replies to him all of the time to the point where when he doesn't reply within a day, Joel immediately gets antsy and wants to go and meet him. Both of those things can't simultaneously be true, and yet in this story they are, because we're trying to merge the game's law with the altered law that we've made in our television series and they just don't match. But they talk about the gunfire and how it's going to attract Fedra to the building and so they've got to leave now. What about all those other fireflies in the city though? What about the plan? Surely the fireflies would have had some kind of backup meetup point though if everything went to hell, right? Apparently not, no. There was there was no backup to this at all. She's, a, she's an incredible leader. And so because Fedra's coming and both of these people are injured, the only people left to smuggle Ali out of the city are Joel and Tess. We're not gonna wait and get the army that would help us voyage out into the foreign land. No, no, we're, ju we're just gonna go out with two people. This was way better handled in the game when Joel had just wiped them all out. I know what's out there. We were going with an entire squadron for that very reason. Why don't you have a squadron? What happened to your squadron? What do have is you. And I know what you're both capable of, for better or worse. What are they capable of? Although I did like that moment as well. <laughs> She's like, if the leader of the Fireflies is scared of him, it must be good. But she promises him, if you could smoke her out of the city, get him to the location, we'll give you everything you need. A car battery, a car, food, guns, anything. You take her out, it's all yours. They have a conversation about whether they're going to do it. And basically come to the conclusion that we can trust her because she's desperate. Y'all talk it through, but please remember that I'm bleeding out. I've got to be honest, if you're having a countdown timer on a scene, that's a pretty good reason for it. We'll get her to your crew at the state house. But before we hand her over, they give us everything that we want. Seems reasonable. Everyone agrees. And so now we take Ali outside. If not, we kill her there and then. Deal. Really? That fast? Yes, Ali. I have a feeling that if you're this annoying already, that after a few episodes, I'll want to do it myself. So they leave and wait for nightfall. We've got Ali being nosy, and of course we've got to show you just how special and intelligent she is. When she finds out his secret smuggling code, and even though it doesn't say what 80 is, you know full well she's going to solve that as well. And you can guarantee if I was a smuggler, I would definitely write down my entire smuggling code and put it right next to the radio for everyone to find. I mean, hey, what good is a top secret code if you don't just put the answer to it right next to the problem? I know that's a video game trope, but that's probably one thing you can leave out of your television series. So who's Bill and Frank? The radio is a smuggling code, right? Oh, she's just so clever. I could have done without this scene. 70s, they got new stuff. What's 80s? You better hope that you remember the decade of every single possible musical song, because otherwise you're in trouble. But he goes to sleep to pass the time. So what's the deal with you anyway? You some kind of bigwig's daughter or something i mean if she was why would she be in the city and if she was a bigwig's daughter for fedra why would she want to leave probably would have made more sense for marlene to keep one of the people near her that looked like her so they at least go yeah it's his daughter at least fake it or give a fake reason oh the radio came on when you were sleeping what was the song like, wake me up before you go go yeah that's right we're still trying to prove how clever she is gotcha 80s means trouble i've cracked the code all on my own aren't i smart you need to know i'm smart code broken 
and annoyingly smog. Definitely on the annoying side rather than the endearing side. <laughs> but now we're under curfew and they definitely can't be spotted because if they are, with how touchy they are with all the explosions, they probably get shot. They literally climb out of the floor because they've dug a tunnel to get onto the wall. And we get Ali once again being firmly on the side of annoying rather than endearing. Holy sh- I'm actually outside. Yeah, there's a big spotlight behind you, love. It's about to shoot you in the face in a second. Oh, 100% would have been spotted there. Well, they sneak off around the side, and at this point, I think they probably assume they're free. Now, once again, this is a deviation from the game, and I'm not really sure how I feel about it. On the one hand, I think they improved it. On the other, I think that's has some major negatives. Because they sneak for a bit, and get spotted by a guard. Now, in the game, they also get caught by guards, except they didn't know these guards, whereas this... This is Mr. Pillboy, and I like this change. I think it pays off the pill scene, which I didn't like when I watched it the first time, but when I saw the ending, oh, I'm like, oh, okay, that scene now actually contributes to the series overall. And if we'd just left it here, if this had been the change and everything else was from the game, I think it would have been an advantage overall. But instead, they also ruined what happened in the game. Because we get the same scenes from the games where he's lined them all up, hands on your head, and I'm gonna scan each one of you to see whether you're ill or not. Really, man? Yep. Game is by the book. The whole fact they know him definitely adds something to this interaction, rather than the first one where you're just like, okay, they're probably not going to be allowed out of here because they're just strangers. So you kind of assume this is going to go a different way, except it doesn't. Because he scans her, she's clean, and they're trying to bribe the way out of the situation. He scans Joel, he's also free, and then Ellie does what she does. Risk my job for half off in mine. <laughs> yeah, she stabs him because she knows what's about to be on that test. The thing is, at this point, there's no turning back. You've just attacked a god, there's only one thing you can do. And in the games, they did it. They reacted, they fought, they won. That's how you get out of here. The instant she does this, there is no going back. When someone makes a stupid decision, everyone has to commit to the plan, or the plan fails. Except that's not what they do. Nobody reacts, nobody does anything, nobody goes for him, and so you just end up with everyone now back under the guard's control. And he's got his gun back on him again. At this point, they're all dead. The show has killed them, because for some reason, Joel didn't react. Tess didn't react. Dead, what we get next is what I consider to be one of the major red flags for the series about where they're going with the characterization of Joel, because this isn't Joel, and I think we're going to have a very different Joel over the course of the series, which is also something the showrunners and Neil Druckmann have already spoken about in interviews. Because rather than springing into action, instead, we're just gonna get a standoff where there's literally nothing he can do. The guard doesn't want to shoot them, but definitely wants to take revenge on Ellie, and Joel won't let him. Whoa! We can fix this! But rather than using his preferred motivation, which would be, I need to smuggle this girl so I can get to my brother, which would have made a lot more sense, and I would hate this scene a lot less if that's what it was, instead, we get the weak Joel. The flashback Joel, where suddenly Ali is his daughter, and it makes him go completely mental. He charges the guy and basically turns his face into paste, to the point where even Ali is like, what on earth are you doing? Don't you think you're going a bit far? Everybody's already dead, Dave. And he just keeps going and going and going. And the entire thing is deliberately to make Joel look completely unhinged. He's absolutely lost control. This isn't Joel. <sighs> oh, you, you saw my dark side come out. And the worst thing about that is not what you've now done to Joel's character for the future, but also none of this was earned. Ali is supposed to forge the bond with her as his daughter over the course of the entire series. That's what earning it would be, that when he spent time with her, eventually he began to see them on the same kind of par, and had that kind of father-daughter relationship with her. Except none of that has been earned. He's just met her, and immediately, the first time she's threatened, he's just like, Oh, my daughter! Ali's my daughter! And loses control over it. It's absolutely ridiculous, it's not earned, it's not deserved, and it entirely ripped me out of the show. But they were so desperate to get that father-daughter idea in there, that it's just sprung into existence within seconds of the meeting in the first episode, and then he entirely loses control for someone which, quite frankly, at the moment, he shouldn't care about at all. She's a meal ticket, that's it. Although she is a sick meal ticket, as the detector shows. Of course, this is the reveal where it turns out she was bitten weeks ago, she's actually immune to it, and that's why she's so important, and why everyone wanted to smuggle that in the first place. This is three weeks old! Nobody lasts more than a day! 
But Joel's like completely off his face at the moment, barely recovered, can't think straight. All of which to me is entirely stupid. Like, we have got to move, there's definitely military coming, we need to get out of here. So Joel grabs his gun, and off they go. Only to cut to the radio with music starting playing, and I don't know what it is, I don't know what decade it's from, but if I had to guess, it's gotta be 80s. And we see the city in the distance as they march into it. I am kind of interested how a fungus knocks over an entire skyscraper. What do you want post-apocalyptic? That's kind of where you draw it. Now for me, this is a tough one, and I would say that the series overall, I'm interested to see where it goes, because there were some bits which I thought were absolutely awesome. The entire 15 minute section at the start, which they just took from the games, I thought was incredible. About as well as anyone could do it. Absolutely no complaints about that section at all, really. There were also additions to what they did in the game, which I thought was an improvement. I like the whole wall exploding in on the people scene, even though I didn't like the start of it. The change of the guard at the end to be somebody new, I thought that was a benefit overall as well. And I like the interactions between Joel, Ali, and Marlene in the corridor, I thought that was all cool. Especially the whole raising and lifting of guns thing to show how important it was. That had layers to the motivations of all the characters that I thought was really, really good, and a great example of show, don't tell. My issue is, a lot of the other additions I thought either made it worse, or were just pointless and shouldn't have been in them in the first place. This episode was 1 hour 22 minutes and it didn't need to be. That entire first 20 minutes of the introduction I just mass cut. It wasn't in the game and it shouldn't have been in this. It added nothing, it was slow, boring, and I think it added a load of plot holes that didn't need to be there at all. And then when we were in the city for the rest of it I think that was all kind of fine with the bodies and everything else showing him working, fine. The problem comes when you started to cut out the action. Because not only did you cut out something which I think would have kept up the pace of the episode, but you also, again, introduced other plot holes on top of a boring character that only existed in this first scene because you had to fill this plot hole that you'd cut out all because of the action. Cutting out that action sequence not only cut out something that would have been great entertainment, but you caused a load of other problems for yourself which I don't think they wrapped up very well or replaced very well at all. And it just seemed- I could only assume it was budgetary. I can't think of any other reason why you would want that scene removed just to be replaced with, oh yeah, we came here and somebody had already had all the fun. But my biggest complaint out of the entire episode is how they treated Joel right at the end, and what they did with Ali, because him thinking of her as his daughter, it's not earned, it's not deserved, it shouldn't have happened, and he shouldn't have lost control. A person who's out of control like that would not have survived this long. He needs to be in control, he needs to be stoic, he needs to be a tough guy, because weak men wouldn't survive in this environment. And I think that is probably the biggest red flag of what they're gonna do to Joel in the future, and I hope I'm wrong about that, because if they do that, they'll destroy the entire series. Overall, I'd probably say it was okay. Because I think some bits were really good, but some bits I just despised. And so overall, I wouldn't say it was good. I would say that with a re-edit and cutting a lot of stuff out, it could have been good. And so the position I'm in now is, I'm interested in the series, I want to see where it goes, but I definitely think there's red flags that this could go downhill fast. Because so far, the best bits about the series have been directly taken from the games and what they've added in just hasn't been anywhere near the same quality, has been largely unnecessary, and just overall dull. And as we get into the series, they're going to be fabricating entire episodes out of nothing. And I think those could well be the weakest out of everything. So, we're gonna have to wait and see on this one. Could the series be good going off the first episode? Absolutely. Could it drop off a cliff? Absolutely. We're not really sure where it's gonna go, and for me, I think it depends how closely they stick to the games, and from how they've been talking in the future, it's only going to be downhill from here. So, we'll have to wait and see till next week. But for now, that's it from me. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Like the video if you liked the video. Subscribe, more videos like this in the future, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.